Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 47 of the Empowering Industry Podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Matthews, and I'm joined by my co-host, Bethany Walmack. Hey, Charlie. Um, back on video again this week. If you missed the message last week, we're on YouTube now. You can see Charlie and me um, being really cool and hanging out on video while we do the podcast. So it's really fun. Check that out on YouTube. Um, but we're really excited that you chose us like you do every week. Uh, please do us a favor. Leave us a rating and review. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Uh, whatever, wherever you are, let us know what you think of the show. Like every week, we're going to cover something going on in social media, preview the news from the Empowering Pumps and Equipment newsletter, and connect you with an industry influencer. But Charlie, how was your week this week? I had a good week. I um, got to a really special like announcement. It was called a maintenance hero. I mean, come on. In my industry, all this time, and they called me a maintenance hero. I still have a little bit of that imposter syndrome when we talk about this, like, I feel like I'm not involved with maintenance, but what, what it said, it was talking about how I would be, um, you know, a voice for women in our industry. And that just really made me happy to be able to, you know, use the skills that I have and the voice like we are doing on the podcast to, you know, support both men and women in our industry. And I always say we're here for engineers, operators, and maintenance. So anyway, I'm your hero. Uh, so, and fight yeah, that. that. Just keep head. telling yourself, you are a hero, Charlie. Actually, go get Carly and let Carly tell you. Maybe you'll believe it then because um, she'll just tell Absolutely. you over and over again. <laughs> That's right. What about you? How was your week? Well, on... I don't know. Early in the week after our podcast came out, I sent my mom the YouTube link because, you know, everybody wants their mom to say how awesome they are. And my mom watched the entire video and just said how cool we were and that she's so proud of me. And I don't know. It's the little things. It just made my week to hear my mom be like, you're doing so great. (laughs) You are. And it does. You're right. Like any little extra happy that, you know, positivity. And so, Thanks for jumping on the video. You know, I think she just liked looking at you, you know, her baby on this, on the video, you know, talking, you know, pump talk. (laughs) Yeah. Pump talk. Um, So I think we should just go ahead and jump into our Let's Get Social segment. Yeah, this is where we're going to talk to you about something going on in social media, something that popped up on our social media that I want to talk about, or just anything that Charlie and I want to talk about this week. Yes. So I always want to talk about our meetups because I love them. And the next one is Empowering Brands. It's tomorrow, if you're listening to this on Monday, March the 16th. It's every third Tuesday. And then Empowering Women's is going to be in April. So that's April 14th because we just had ours. Um, And that's every second Wednesday. If y'all want to put that on your calendar, it's at 11 Central Time. Uh, So I forgot to tell everybody what the pumps one was. So go for it. (laughs) So empowering brands or empowering pumps, however we say that, the March 16th uh, will be at 3 p.m. Central Time. And it's our happy hour. And I think I'm going to need it. I'm actually going down to the beach and I'll be at the beach. So I may be calling in with a real happy hour experience this week. Well, I will be calling in with my St. Patty's Day hat because I dug it out of the closet just for this special occasion. Um, I wore green today. For the video, so when you're watching this next week, um, and I will for the happy hour on Tuesday. We hope to see you. Do need to register, pre-register for those. The link is in the show notes, um, and then we'll email you the Zoom link, and you can turn on your camera, introduce yourself, say hi. We can talk about pumps, talk about what you want to talk about for the week, just to get everybody in the industry together. It's really fun, and it'll be my first one uh, that I've been back for in a while, and so I'm really excited to see uh, the pump guy. Who we're going to talk about later. And all the other guys that are always on this call, guys and girls that we're always happy to talk to. So that's right. And, you know, one of the things that we like to do on here is to give a shout out. So stay connected with us at Empowering Pumps. Mention us. Use the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast and stay connected with us. Okay. So, Charlie, you said that you're going to the beach this week. And I specifically remember a year ago uh, this week. You were about to head to the beach, and it was right when coronavirus started shutting everything down in the U.S. And so today for our Let's Get Social segment, um, I just want to, you and I, just have a conversation and talk about, reflect on living an entire year in the pandemic, uh, what it's been like for the industry, 
what changes have happened for the industry, what it meant to us personally, all those kind of things. And hopefully it can be kind of cathartic for everyone listening as we, you know, take this week to kind of reflect on how we move forward. Yeah. And I thought it was such a great topic uh, that you reached out and told me we we're going to talk about this because you're right. It's been a year. Um, and I can remember that feeling at being down at the beach and knowing like, do I just come home? Do I rush home? Do I, you know, go out to eat with a mask on? What do I do? And uh, feeling like everything I was doing was wrong. <laughs> and well, being the good, like we've learned a lot since then too. You know, like we know the beach is relatively safe. So um, that's right. That's you know, right. Being it, outside it's, it's, is a good thing. Yeah. It's those things we didn't know then. So it was scary, you know? It was so scary. And, you know, we just want to acknowledge that it, was, it made a huge impact on us, our personal lives. Uh, we had, you know, over 2 million deaths worldwide and 500,000 in the U.S. I mean, this, this is substantial, right? They have a loss and just an upsetting time. And we just wanted to talk about it because I think a lot of people are kind of going through this as we're thinking about the future. Yeah, I heard someone talking about this, that it's going to be a really unique point in history where we all have the same shared traumatic experience, you know, something bad that happened that we're all living through at the same time. Um, And on that note, you know, like lots of people, I feel like it made us all come face to face with our mental health issues because we were stuck inside. We couldn't go do anything and we had to confront them or we you know, we're stuck inside and couldn't go see our friends and do the things that normally make us happy and that are that humans are programmed to do, you know. And so I think a lot of people have struggled this year. And I did want to mention, you know, if you are struggling, you're definitely not alone. Find help, find a therapist. Um, they're wonderful. And our good friend Rob uh, has a podcast called Dismantling the High Performance Narrative uh, that's all about mental health and um, and successful people in the industry and how you deal with it. And I just, he's done great this year getting the word out and helping people deal with their mental health during COVID, I think. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the one thing for me is these meetups that I talk about of, you know, how excited I am. It's because that's what got me through. Um, I had to be able to see people and, you know, be able to talk about new things. And, you know, if that was my new thing for the week or every two weeks is what we did. And then, you know, when I think about what what isolation does to us, how it changes our bodies, how we react to people, how we don't go into a a situation where we're going to have to get close to somebody or talk to them. We're going to have a lot of issues coming back to work and being able to talk to people and look them in the eye and, you know, just how are we going to interact? It's going to take some time. So I think it's important, uh, like you said, for high achievers or high performers is what we're supposed to call ourselves. Um, (laughs) Rob gives a great, you know, um, he, I guess a great way to look at it is like, we are all affected differently here. And if we can talk about our mental health and talk about how this affected us, then we can get through it faster. We can, um, you know, get a healthy relationship with ourselves and others as we move forward. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, well, and there's no real easy way to transition out of that. Get help. Mental health is important. Thanks for talking about it. I love talking about it. You know, send me a message, whatever. Um, but like shifting into what it looked like uh, for the industry, Charlie, uh, why don't you start and tell us kind of like some of the big things, like how the pump industry and what COVID meant to the industry as a whole? Well, I think if we look back and it was early June, I believe, when we really were talking about this a lot, we are, we talked about the essential workers. Uh, The pandemic really did highlight a lot of our skilled workers. And, you know, I was always excited to hear about um, the workers mentioned and always, you know, wanting to hear more, right? So uh, water treatment plants, manufacturers, plumbers, everyday, um, you know, services that we need really came to light. And that was the difference. You know, people had to adapt and had to adapt to safety protocols. And they have these people, the essential workers, they have to wear their masks. They have to go to work. They have to perform that task. Um, And it's so different than us, you know, complaining about sitting at home. Um, It's a whole nother step uh, of being out in that public life um, and taking care of people. And, you know, then they had to come home to their families and the worry that would cause like, you know, what are they exposing their families to? And I remember early on when we started the podcast, which was kind of a response to COVID, um, you know, and something that we could do to provide something for the community. We had that interview with Judeline 
who's a plumber in New York City, um, Judah Line, sorry. And she talked about, you know, being fearful going into people's houses, not really for herself, but scared that she was going to take someone and get like get someone sick. And just like hearing her really crystallize that. And that was in early April, I think, really put it in perspective for me because it also wasn't super bad in the South yet. And she was in New York City where it was the first hot spot and made me really well, I think appreciate- also like. Yeah, like when she had to bring it home, like she's scared to go in, but then she's also scared that she picks something up and bringing it home with her. So that was, it was, it was really um, powerful, that message that she gave us on the podcast to understand what they're dealing with, to walk in and do their job every day. Yeah. And I really hope that people like have a sense of pride that do all these jobs and like, you know, a lot of times people just go to work and you do your job and you come home, but like, Essentially, if you had to go into work to do your job, to be an essential worker, that means society could not function without you. So thank you, all of you who did that um, and kept this industry, kept this country going. Um, You know, I hope we can all appreciate that a little more, even if things do go back to This is why I love you, Bethany. Like, you (laughs) just bring it. I mean, I've got all the feels and I, I believe it. I believe that you know, we, we care about these people and, and we know how valuable you are to society. So just thank you. Like she said, thank you for everything that you do. Yeah. And then, so in the industry, we also saw our partners, other companies in the industry doing innovative things as an answer to coronavirus. So back in the summer there, we read an article with a research study that said one in four U.S. manufacturing manufacturers were considering automating due to COVID. And so, you know, that's an answer to a problem to help keep people uh, not in as close contact with each other. Then we saw companies, you know, like Xylem donated 30,000 units of PPE for healthcare workers. Other, lots of other companies did that as well, or they repurposed um, their equipment that they have that was used to print other things like Dean Houston, an exhibiting logistics company in Houston, uh, repurposed their big printers that they weren't using for trade shows anymore to make masks. Um, and then super cool. Yeah, it's, it's super cool. And it's, you know, we all want to do something and they figured out how to do something. And that, so that's people in our industry that were really helping. And, uh, a couple others flow serve. I just read provided, uh, or provides a pump for Pfizer that helps in vaccine production. And, um, then if you go on our website and you're in the news and you just search COVID, you can see like our other partners and our stories that have run for companies and partners that are doing things with COVID. And one that I thought was cool was J.K. Muir did a webinar where they analyzed wastewater trends, like, and because we saw a big shift from commercial to residential. Um, And so they really looked at that and the impacts and implications moving forward on the wastewater industry. It was really fascinating, I think. Yeah, I agree. And one of the things I really noticed was the technology adaption or or adoption, however you want to say that. Both. Um, But yeah, (laughs) exactly, exactly. So one, I I mean, for me with creating a social media, you know, company and seeing how long it took people to kind of get on board, it really is special to me. But we saw, you know, people taking advantage of Zoom. You know, we've done our happy hours virtually, different webinars. I mean, webinars really did pick up and we were ready for that, which I was thankful that our team was ready to support. Um, Which, but also, like, um, build- I just want to yep. chime in on those happy hours. I think it's funny, and I think this will cause people to laugh. There was like March and April where it was like, we must see all of our friends that we haven't seen in months, and we must see them once a week for a Zoom happy hour where we do games, and it's really fun. And then that kind of died off back to like a normal level of when you would see people. But uh, that's so true. I just thought it was it's really so true, fun. you know, it, yeah. and it was, it was, we, we saw that move and that shift. And, you know, and the reason why we moved to monthly happy hours, because like less people were like feeling that need, I guess, or having the extra time to devote every week to it. Uh, but you're right. Everybody was doing that. It wasn't just us, you know, no. it was all over the you know TVs and, and all of my and, friend groups, my family, like I got the Jackbox for- game set. We were good to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so, you know, 
both personal life and professional uh, webinars, learning, um, our Slack group, which it started uh, with the maintenance community. They created a Slack group uh, where I just saw how much conversation and engagement we could have there in our communities. And so, you know, we created Empowering Women's Slack group, which launched last week, uh, which was super fun and, you know, already engaged in there. And so I think that those things will last Other things to note were virtual conferences. You know, we did our Empowering Women's Conference. That was, you know, brand new for us. And we had to learn that technology and then teach others. Um, And I always thought it was kind of fun when a trade show would call me and be like, what are y'all doing? What do you think? And and we had done that. And that happened a lot. Yes. (laughs) That happened a lot. Yeah. Don't sell yourself short. (laughs) Right. So, you know, I love seeing that. I do want to talk a little bit about it from the standpoint of, the certification. So we know that water operators have to be certified. Um, I'm sure there's many other things that have to go through this certification process. Um, but we had talked about it early on with Steve, um, uh, Stevens. And he he was like, you know, I don't know how we're going to do these certifications. People can't come in and get certified. We're going to have this loss. And they started doing them virtually. Um, I, you know, look at Steve Hernandez, who just launched his training. So he does a lot of trainings to prep for these certifications for operators. He's going to virtual and he's going to continue to teach people how to do that um, and take those tests virtually because it's going to look different and it's going to be different for a different learning curve for everyone. And I just think if we go back and think about this, we taught people how to communicate a little bit better on these virtual digital tools. And we're going to see a lot more people adapting things quicker when we kind of go back into the industry. Uh, not locked down, however you say that, Uh, which is great, you know, and I'm excited to look for the future and see, you know, the things that we learned and how we can take that with us forward. Yeah. And so before recording, I, we talked to our team and, you know, asked Vince and Becca, like what they're hearing from partners and how, uh, you know, our customers are looking to the future, what they're going to change, what they're going to keep. And some of the answers were that, you know, they're really looking into making their marketing budgets more for digital things. So like producing video and doing webinars and finding that they need to use those kind of technologies more so than maybe their print budget was set for last year. Um, Yeah. And there's one more thing on that, Bethany, that I forgot to talk to you about. The the thing is, we had to recreate the way that we took care of our partners when there wasn't a trade show. And so we created videos with them and shared them. And that was really uh, better because there wasn't a distraction. They weren't, we weren't interrupting people at booths and, and that type of thing. And so we'll continue to do that moving forward. So I think it's something that we've learned um, and can help the customer a little better that way as well. Yeah. And I mean, quick plug, like this is what we do is digital digital marketing, you know, so if, if you need help with things, definitely reach out to us and let us know because this is the way things are moving. Even as COVID goes back, hopefully away, we'll just throw it away, whatever. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but like, that's the way things are moving and people are investing more in digital initiatives and, you know, that's exciting. It's, it's a, it's nice to see companies succeeding in their endeavors that way. Yeah, for certain. And, you know, when we get back to having, you know, lots of people, that's a completely different thing. Uh, We have started seeing people have meetings. Uh, Vince went back in the summer, he met with some customers. um, And then, you know, we've had our first trade show, you know, we were wearing masks back in December, I went to one and I didn't love it. I got to be honest, I don't like the interaction with the mask. I feel like I don't really feel like I can talk to people or read people the same way. Like I prefer like, here, just talk to me on Zoom. At least I can read your body language. Um, but I'm, I'm so excited to for that shift. And I would absolutely go to a trade show with a mask. I just hope and, you know, I'm looking forward to people opening back up and, and us, you know, getting through this and not having. Okay. And on that note, you know, moving forward, we're still seeing that the pump industry is still projected to grow over the next five years. And it's really finding the ways to meet the demand needs to keep people healthy and adapting to the market and the supply chain, how all of that works. And we're just seeing, seeing the industry thrive, I think, under the circumstances, like doing amazing, uh, 
in their answer to the coronavirus. And, you know, I agree. I think our industry is amazing and all the things that they've contributed during this time has really made a difference. And you will see things like you said, supply chain, you'll see that it's going to be completely different. People have looked out and seen, okay, we're not going to go through this again and adapted some things or changed some things. So yeah, I'm super proud of our industry. And we really want to keep this conversation going, you know, tell us how you're doing, like, uh, what positive things you learned over the past year, maybe a new technology you learned, a new group that you joined, or, you know, what you're looking forward to in this next year as we hopefully move out of the pandemic. Um, you can talk to us on social media, you know, tag us at Empowering Pumps or use the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast. Really anything you want to talk about, we're here to listen. Um, I just, I think it's worth reflecting on, you know, the year we've had for sure. Um, Absolutely. I agree. Um, okay. It's well, fun. now that we'll shake off the, the sappy, uh, you know, emotional discussion we just had and move into the news. So in the news, we're going to preview something coming out from the empowering pumps and equipment newsletter this week. And first yes. we have the person of the week, Charlie. Yes. Uh, and this one's kind of special to me because I had not heard the term manufacturing engineer. So Ricky volunteered um, to let us feature him during engineers week. And so Ricky from ABB motors and mechanical, um, he was featured and he talked to us about the things that he loved about his job, you know, and it's because they have, you know, work, they get to work on different projects and different kinds of things all the time. And he just really likes helping people. And I just thought that was so great coming from this manufacturing engineer. And um, yeah, I learned something new. Yeah. So check out his feature. The link will be in the show notes. And from our site, you can nominate someone so they can be featured next week as well. And speaking of ABB uh, in the news, we have a really great article that, you know, just touches me because it's a question that I ask myself, right? Um, that I need a trusted advisor to make a water plan for more resilient and energy efficiency. Uh, yes, I need one. I think everybody needs one. Uh, but ABB offers this local water expertise to help people find new and better ways to improve their water operations. And again, I just think that this could be helpful to everybody. They help identify many possible factors that can influence both the resiliency or the operating cost of assets and equipment um, that you may use in the water and wastewater industries for, you know, treatment or distribution. And so ABB, you know, they, they are always giving us things um, to help us learn. And one of the things is webinars that we've been focused on. Uh, they have on our site uh, webinars on reducing energy costs um, to ensure continual uptime, which we know is super important. And then to reduce risk in pipe breaks and water leaks. Um, you know, I think that. Also, the webinar on keeping your impeller and your wastewater pump clean. I mean, it just goes on and on. So many different uh, tools that you can look for on our site. Um, but this is the one about, you know, do you need a trusted advisor? I think the answer is yes. Always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always. Uh, the story I want to share is titled, To Boost Safety and Lifespan, Power Plants Turn to Carbon Graphite Materials. Now, I chose to talk about this one because I'm in Texas. We just lived through the, you know, ice apocalypse of 2021. And all of us here became experts in power plants and how they work in the span of a few days. They are needed. Yes, they yes, are. Very needed. Um, but so I'm going to try to break this down and make sure I'm understanding it correctly. The basic premise of power plants they're all the same. You need some type of energy source that produces heat. The heat boils water, creating pressurized steam, which spins large turbines. And then turbines use magnets and coils to produce electricity through induction. And no matter the fuel source or in these different configurations, one thing remains constant is that the materials they use have to be able to withstand a high heat and high pressure to run safely. And so carbon graphite is really unrivaled and is the industry standard for what you use to create your parts and your machines that are running in these power plants. Um, but as power plants, you know, they get more complex. Engineers are constantly like pushing boundaries to try to find ways to meet different standards and different applications of using carbon graphite and how they can make it even better by uh, impregnating it with other minerals and things like that. Yes. Um, 
<laughs> impregnating well, sounds like a very weird word to talk about minerals, but that's what the scientists say. So I'll take it. Hey, I feel like I learned a lot already. Uh, Bethany, it's, you're teaching us as we teach everyone else. And then, um, you know, this is from one of our partners, Metcar. And so if anybody else wants to learn about graphite materials, then just head on over there to our partner page and take a look at them. Yeah, they're doing some really cool things and learning, you know, how to perfect their carbon graphite materials to support the industry. And I just, it's it's a really interesting read if you're from Texas and anywhere else, but you should probably read it if you're wanting to learn more about power plants. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm excited about the next segment too. It's one of my favorites. The industry interview, an all-time favorite. We have a favorite guest on the show. Charlie goes out and finds someone awesome in the industry to bring and talk to you and hopefully, you know, make your Monday. And I think this guy's going to do it for us. So who do you have this week, Charlie? Yes, it's Larry Backus. He's the pump guy. And if you've ever been to one of my meetups, you know what I'm talking about. He lives and breathes pump. He knows all there is to know about pumps. He has more than 40 years experience in the industrial pump area. Um, he has been diagnosing pumps and pump problems, seal failure for years and years. And, you know, I thought that was very interesting that uh, he also, you know, served in the Navy and he graduated from UAB. So, you know, I said a little roll tide during my interview. Um but today, Larry, you know, he's a leading expert and he's doing these training courses on pumps and you'll see uh, one coming up in April. So hopefully you'll get to take advantage of that. But he also, have, he's written books. You know, I mentioned everything you need to know about pumps. That's his book. Um, and he translates these in both, you know, English and Spanish. Uh, so they're available for sale. And he's, he's got a lot of interesting inventions that he doesn't talk about. He doesn't talk about it in the interview either. Uh, but I think you should reach out to him and ask him, like, what are your inventions, Larry? So... Well, cool. and you mentioned he has his books are in English and Spanish. He's fluent in both languages and will teach the courses in both languages, which I think is, you know, exceptional yes. coming from a person who only knows one language fluently. So, um, yeah, and really he's from Alabama interesting and Tennessee. Guy. So, you know, props for getting outside and learning. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And like Charlie mentioned, he is almost always on our industry meetup calls and is a really fun guy. So when you listen to this interview and you're going to love it, I'm sure, make sure you're on the call on Tuesday so you can ask him follow up questions from the interview um, on that call. So without further delay, here's our interview. Hey, Larry, welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, for the people who don't know you, um, let me just set it up for them. Uh, he's the pump guy. So if you need to know anything about pumps, you need to ask Larry. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. But Larry, how would you introduce yourself? Well, I, I'm the pump guy. Uh, I'm a, an old uh, maintenance guy. I worked in maintenance, uh, refineries and steel mills and such. And um, uh, I've uh, written a couple of books on pumps, and they've been well received. And um, uh, that's uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, uh, well, why did you yeah. get in? Why did you get in the industry, Larry? Like, how did you come to find pumps? I was always mechanically inclined uh, as a child. I wanted to modify and fix and make my electric train do things that it wasn't supposed to do, and and a bicycle, and and I uh, fashioned my own go kart uh, with a lawnmower engine a number of years ago, and so I was always mechanically inclined. And then I had an opportunity to go to work for Republic Steel. Uh, they had a steel mill in Birmingham, and I started off as a, a, a maintenance apprentice, and then uh, worked my way up to being a, 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 I guess they call it a first class mechanic uh, with Republic Steel. And uh, then, uh, well, I got drafted into the military. Uh, these were the, the Vietnam years. And uh, I was uh, told that I would uh, uh, do what I wanted to do. I, uh, I, they actually put me to doing something else, and I had to fight to, to uh, get into the maintenance division. They put me on a pump improvement team. And so I was on a pump improvement team while I was in the Navy. And uh, then after the Navy, I uh, went back to the University uh, of Alabama. Uh, just as UAB was separating from Tuscaloosa, 
And uh, I think I started as a subcampus of Tuscaloosa and then graduated as its own little university. So and it has grown. Yeah. Uh, and um, then, uh, well, went to work in uh, went to work in maintenance. And uh, uh, I am a, I, I'm a, 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 I'm a maintenance technician, a, a mechanic and uh, also an operator and also an engineer. Uh, so I, uh, I know that I have, a, a, I can relate easily with mechanics and equipment operators and, and engineers. And that really uh, so is that, a different that helps world. Me. Yeah. Cause that that's helps a different me. world for sure. And, and we're trying to get all those people together to talk, to improve pump systems. So you can see it from every direction, really. I um, really can. Yeah. I really can. And it helps me. It helps me uh, with my work. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And so part of that, so you're in there, you're working, you're seeing these problems that kind of come up over and over again. Um, is that what led you to write the book? Did somebody ask you, I guess, how did you go from um, kind of working in the business to then that consultant role? I had a pump improvement. Uh, I, I, I had a pump uh, rebuild shop uh, for a few years and uh, we rebuilt pumps and uh, we started uh, noticing that the pumps were all coming into the shop for the same reasons. And um, uh, so I, I started to, well, this is, this shouldn't be happening. And so we started to, okay, let's, let's fix the pump this way, or let's upgrade the pump this way. Uh, let's change this or that. And, and, uh, and then I, I realized, you know what, we've got to change some of the things that they are doing. They're, operating the pumps incorrectly or the pumps are not properly designed into their pipe systems. And uh, the more that I got into it, I realized that uh, uh, sometimes the engineers, uh, well, uh, they're not doing anything wrong, but they, they, they have to breeze through pumps in the university in a course called fluid mechanics. And uh, the, the professor dedicates one or two classroom periods to pumps. And, um, if you and many mecha, uh, many engineers don't work with pumps uh, because they're building cars or they're making furniture or, or writing software, so uh, they don't work with pumps. But some engineers do work with pumps. And uh, if you go to work with a company uh, that makes a liquid product, maybe milk, maybe honey, maybe gasoline uh, or pesticide, then you're really surrounded by pumps. And these are this is the chemical process industry. And uh, pumps are a big part of what you do. And the education that you get in the university is uh, inadequate to be in that industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've kind of dedicated myself to uh, addressing some of those needs and and uh, helping uh, engineers relate better with uh, operators and relate better with maintenance and bring people together. Uh, so that's that. That's what I do, and that's how I got got into this. But anyway, I wanted to um, you know dive into that a little bit more because I think that that is the challenge and and bringing these people together. I love how you do that on our you know calls when we have our meetups and our zooms. You're like, okay, where are you from? What do you do? Um, and let's see how we can connect people. So we definitely have that in common. Um, and I I think that you know what you've created and have these tools that, you know, going through and learning the, I guess the common problems, you know, you've got the resources for people to learn how, you know, I can talk to people and connect them, but I don't know how to, I, I say, I just know enough to be dangerous about how to work on a pump. Um, so, so what is the best first step for somebody who is trying to get into, I guess, understanding pumps? To understanding pumps. Um, to understanding pumps, study pumps, and read a uh, read about pumps, uh, read books on pumps, uh, and um, that's probably where to start. And and also go work with pumps. In other words, uh, I have uh, people that uh, want to come to my pump seminar, and they want to travel two hours by airplane to come to one of my pump seminars so that they can take apart a pump. So why don't you take apart the pumps where you work? Why don't you go into the maintenance shop where you work? Oh, I'm afraid to go in there because they'll know that I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> right. well, like, there's only one way to get through it. There's only one way to get through it. You ask questions and you say, what are you doing? What, what is this? And uh, and before long, it'll, it'll all come to you. And uh, people don't, people, people normally don't think that you're stupid because you ask a, a simple question. They, so so uh, ask your simple questions. It's the only way to learn. 
Yeah, I think that's so important. And the hands-on is is so different. It really is than anything else. I remember going to this little uh, pump uh, show. I don't remember what it was called. Maybe Pump Users uh, Symposia. Maybe that got that right. Uh, but it was my first ever event where uh, they were putting a seal together, you know, put, putting the seal into the pump. And I was like, wow, this is cool, right? Like I could really try. I could really do that with instruction. And so I think it is, it's just about getting out of your comfort zone, asking the question, okay, now how do I do this? And then trying it and and getting better. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so tell us about the book. So the book is everything you need to know about pumps. That was one of the first ones you wrote. So, uh, well, I think it is the first one that you wrote. Uh, it was the third one that I wrote. Third one. Uh, okay. I, yeah, I, I, I ghost wrote uh, a couple of books for training companies. And uh, I was the writer of the book and, and they turned into pump courses. And um, and then I wrote a book uh, called uh, No One Understands Centrifugal Pumps. Uh, and then uh, Everything You Need to Know About Pumps. Uh, and I'm working on another one right now. Um, and it's going to lean more into uh, operation and design. Um so uh, I continue to write, uh, and um, uh, th- that's what's coming up. And that book came about just because of uh, owning the uh, uh, working at the uh, the pump rebuild shop, and seeing the pumps that came in. I I perceive that so many pumps are operated like bumper cars at the circus. <laughs> All right. I mean, in other words, you can't drive in traffic if you're driving your car like a bumper car in circus, in the circus or the the county fair. Uh, I find that that's the way that so many pumps are operated. Um, A person says, you know, that sitting in that control room, uh, watching that monitor screen of all the pumps and the the liquids crossing across the screen, and uh, the pump is maybe, it has a green light if the pump is on and a red light if the pump is off. So if that were your car, and all you knew that the engine was on or off uh, and nothing else, that would be considered inadequate. And yet that's the way, that's what I see when I go into most uh, uh, control rooms. Uh, the pump is green if it's on, it's, or it's red if it's off. And sometimes, sometimes those are, are switched. The, the green if it's uh, green if it's off and red if it's on. Uh, oh, the, that's thought, the, the, the alternate <laughs> thought is if it's uh, green, uh, that means uh, the pump is off and you can put your hands into it to work on it. So if it's red, the pump is running. So keep your hands away from it. So, uh, and the, all of that is uh, whatever the chief engineer wants. They, they can assign it green or red or purple if they want to. Uh, but uh, that's, that's generally what most operators know. And uh, some pumps, like if you were driving in downtown morning city heavy traffic, you've got to maintain constant control. Uh, of what you're doing is a, is a car about to turn lanes into me? Do I have to turn left at the next intersection? Is somebody going to step out into traffic? Is a taxi door going to open into traffic? Am I can I can I straddle that pothole or do I have to hit the pothole? Uh, you've got to maintain constant attention when you're operating some pumps, and uh, uh, I, I didn't say sump pumps, some <laughs> pumps, process pumps. That is a a thing, y'all. Yes. uh, So you have to maintain uh, constant attention. And and I ask this question many times. How many cars can you drive at one time in in downtown city traffic? How many cars can you drive and and avoid accidents at one time? Well, there you go. There you go. And then then says, well, then you're and now, now they're sitting at a screen and they're watching seven or eight pumps. Well, uh, these are the pumps. The pump only has one way that it can complain, bearings and seals. That's how the pump complains. Like a newborn baby. The newborn baby can't say, my diapers are full. The newborn baby only has one way of letting the mother or the father know that it's something has to change. Yes. (laughs) Maybe the baby's cold. Maybe the baby's hungry. Maybe the baby's tired. Maybe the baby wants to be picked up. The mother has to interpret that. And, and then, and then when the baby is satisfied, the baby calms down. And so the pump is kind of like a baby. The, The baby can only cry. And the pump has one way of complaining, bearings and seals. And, um, so, if, if the pump is behaving, leave it alone. If the pump is complaining, in other words, if you're changing, 
uh, seals every few months. If you if you're if the bearings are overheating, if the pump is vibrating, then you've got to change something to fix that. Uh, sometimes I relate it with the uh, uh, the electrician. If a fuse burns on an electrical circuit, or if a breaker uh, shuts or, or opens on an electrical circuit, the electrician knows the fuse is not to blame. It's not the it's not the breaker's fault. There is a problem in the electrical circuit, and if we chase the problem in the electrical circuit, the next fuse or the next breaker will not open, or the next fuse won't burn. Uh, we go over to the maintenance shop, and they're blaming the seals. What's wrong? Those seals are no good. These bearings keep failing. The mechanics don't know how to install the bearings. The mechanics don't know how to install the seals. That. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. The bearings and the seal are to the pump what the fuse is to the electrical circuit. The, the bearing and the seal is the way that the pump can complain about a problem in the hydraulic circuit. That's the way that I look at it. And, that's, and that has helped me to solve so many problems with my yeah, clients. So- so I love it. The noisy pump and the crying baby analogy that, that makes it perfect sense to me and in making sure that, you know, you don't just look at the problem. I mean, we've talked about that a lot in just company culture too, right? It's, you know, they're just going to change it out and run it to fail, run it to fail. And sometimes maybe it's, it's okay. I remember Rob saying, you know, sometimes the light bulb is okay to run to fail, but if it's a critical light bulb, like a safety um, alarm or something like that, you don't want it to fail. So looking at it like that, I think is, is a great way. And there's nothing wrong with run to fail. Just be sure you're running in the right direction. <laughs> there you run, go. It, run it to fail in the right direction. Yes. Yeah, let the light bulb do its job until it burns out. And then the, the same thing with the pump. Uh, I also uh, have a tendency to say, you, you know, that when, when you're driving a car, When you start the engine of a car, you're starting seven or eight pumps, the water pump, the fuel pump, the oil pump, the power steering pump, the brake pedal, the pump that squirts water at the windscreen, the uh, transmission recirculating uh, fluid pump, and the, uh, the air conditioner compressor is a cousin to a pump. So we're not even aware that we're operating pumps. We think that we're driving to the grocery store. Well, yeah, we're operating pumps. If you have a if you have a, a dishwasher in your kitchen, automatic dishwasher, an automatic dishwasher has three pumps on it. It has a grinder pump that grinds up food. You taught me this. It has a soap pump, and and the grinder pump cannot be the wash pump, and the soap pump cannot be the rinse pump. So so then uh, there are three pumps on an automatic dishwasher. Um, and then the clothes washer and, and maybe you've got solar panels and maybe you have a solar heat and maybe you have geothermal, uh, heating in your home and, and, and maybe a jet ski. All of these are pumps and they will run 20, 30 years and they all have bearings and seals. The thing is they are properly designed into their pipe systems. That's, that's the secret designing the pump into the pipe system. And I find that that's where uh, that's where a lot of people uh, fall short, and it's also where maybe uh, the engineers don't get the best information in the university. Yeah, I think one of the uh, the biggest things that I learned was, you know, if you just want you've got one pump and you want to, you know, more flow, you just add another pump, and that wasn't the case, right? It doesn't it doesn't just was not one plus one equals two. Like it's no. completely different. And I think you know. If you're not taught that, then it would make sense that way for that kind of process thinker. So um, just to your point, reading books and and working with different mentors and people who have been there and learned these things uh, does help help, I guess, even, you know, somebody maybe not brand new to the industry, but later on too, um, just constantly learning. But one thing I wanted to ask you, because, you know, you've seen a lot of pumps and you've seen, you've worked with a lot of people. What is the like problem that just keeps coming up? What would you say with the kind of all pumps or, or processes? What's a common problem that you just think, I know how to solve this. I wish everybody knew how to solve this. That keeps appearing. I think uh, cavitation uh, is probably responsible 
for 30 to 40 percent of all pump failures. The pump is cavitating. And we don't think that it's cavitation. We think, well, the bearings keep failing, but the bearings are failing because the pump's in cavitation. Or the mechanical seal continues to fail because the pump has an inadequate net positive suction head available to the pump. And so there's not enough thought given to that. Uh, it's thought to be a maintenance problem uh, because the evidence of cavitation is seen in the maintenance shop and cavitation tends to calm down when a pump is rebuilt and put back into service. Uh, but it, cavitation and inadequate NPSH is actually a, an engineering problem. So it's a, design, it's a design problem. And we've got to fix the design. Uh, the cavitation will go away when we fix it. And, and it's not just a matter of, hey, you need to start a vibration program, or why don't we go to synthetic lubricants? That will give you maybe a modest improvement, but it's not going to make the problem go away. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of what's, uh, that, that I find 30 to 40% of all pumps that are in the shop today around the globe, cavitation or, and or inadequate net positive suction head. So how do we get that information to the designers? What does that look like? If we're, if we know that's what it is, how, how does that process work? Well, is I it, guess they have to read and study it. And if they will recognize, they'll say, a, a, what, can, what can be done to stop it? Or what can I do to improve the margin of NPSHA over NPSHR? And where is the pump operating on its curve? Where is the pump performing? Uh, you need uh, differential pressure gauges and a flow meter. And what I see is so many pumps don't have gauges and, and many of them don't have a flow meter. Uh, some pumps will have a discharge gauge, a discharge pressure gauge. And uh, that's only half of the information. The discharge gauge is a function of the suction gauge. So, so I love it. I love, so I just wanted everybody to kind of hear Larry, your expertise and knowledge on this. I mean, you could go on for days, uh, talking about it, but I'm curious kind of what, what you're doing now. Like you've been in here, you've been, um, you know, grew up in the pump industry stayed, uh, but now you're in Tennessee. So we're from Alabama to Tennessee. That had to be a shock. Uh, but you know, what are you doing today? What am I doing today? Well, I, I write a little bit still, and um, I'm uh, slowly sliding into retirement. Uh, I don't want to just stop. Uh, I, I'm just uh, doing a little bit less and less each year. Uh, that's that's kind of what I'm doing, and and I'm enjoying my time. I I uh, realize I don't have to get up every morning at five o'clock and. And maybe I can turn off the alarm and go back and get another hour. And but then something says, okay, it's time to get up, time to start the come day, to work. come to work, time to do something. And uh, I have learned, I've made myself learn PowerPoint. People tell me that if I stop teaching pumps, I could always teach PowerPoint. Um, I, I really enjoy PowerPoint. I can get lost into PowerPoint. I'll sit down with my computer and start playing with power. I wonder if I can make, wonder if I can make this liquid move through the pipe and fill up the tank, that type stuff. Uh, and, uh, and then before I know it, three hours has gone by and I haven't even had my breakfast. Still my, still sipping on my morning coffee and it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Is it time just goes by? A pump is flowing though. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So, uh, <laughs> That's, uh, I guess that's really what I'm doing. Uh, I, I might be taking a cooking course coming up here uh, in the cool. near future. Yeah. Uh, learning to do other things. Uh, so, so that's, that's what's up with me. Yeah. And so I've seen you also. So in your re almost retirement, we'll say um, you're still consulting, you're still doing the training, you're still um, active in our community. So what's coming up next for you that I saw um, is a training in April. Can you tell me a little bit about that with Sonia? With Sonia, uh, well, that'll be a four-day pump course. It uh, has information for engineers. It has information for equipment operators. It has information for uh, maintenance people. So if you're in maintenance, if you're, if you're an operator, if you're an engineer, uh, you can certainly sign up for the course. Uh, it's with uh, Sonia Mathura, and her company is... Uh, da, 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 East, da, is East, well, she's Strategic Reliability. Strategic Reliability Solutions out of Trinidad, uh, down in the Caribbean. That's an island in the Caribbean. And um, 
and that's uh, yeah that's coming up in april and um that'll be uh, four days and uh i think the registration fee is uh, eighteen hundred dollars per person mm-hmm. and i believe i'm not sure this is sonia's decision there might be a uh, might be a discount for multiple registrations from the same company and maybe even an early bird registration i'm not sure about that so That's is this an decision. online or an in-person? It's online. Account? It's going to be by Zoom. Going to be by yeah. Zoom. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I will definitely include that in our show notes and um, send out, you know, all the links we've talked about with to your books. But, you know, just as we've been talking and kind of like the thing that you want to leave our audience with, um, what have you kind of been thinking about or, or something that you want to say to the pump community? I watch a television program. I think it comes out of Canada called How It's Made. Maybe you've seen that on your cable TV. And um, it's impressive how, uh, say, uh, uh, an employee, a person, will uh, dump a bag of uh, sugar and a bag of flour and some honey or syrup and and water uh, into a hopper, uh, shut the door, turn on the mixer. Uh, and then from that point on, 20 minutes later, biscuits or crackers or cakes are coming off the assembly line with practically zero human intervention. And that is the future. And I have actually adjusted my seminars. Uh, I used to say, the operator must do this. And I'm now saying, look, the operator or intelligent instrumentation uh, 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 automation, uh, automation can do this. An airplane practically flies itself. Commercial aviation, uh, the pilot turns, uh, turns the airplane over to the autopilot, maybe a thousand feet off the ground. And then the autopilot will avoid the mountains and go around thunderheads and avoid other air traffic and avoid storms, maybe a hurricane. And the, uh, the autopilot will line up with the uh, airport in San Francisco, and then the pilot uh, lands the airplane. Uh, I understand that the next generation of uh, commercial airplanes, the, the airplane will uh, drive itself to the terminal and park at the gate. Wow. So there's very little for the pilot to do. So uh, we see so many processes uh, on the television where products are made with uh, zero or minimal human intervention. And I think that the chemical process industry, that is definitely the future of the chemical process industry. And anyone who stops learning, anyone who says, I have my job secure, it's not secure. If you stop learning, if you stop your education, you will be redundant. You will be replaced. You must continue learning and you must continue moving forward. Um, That's what I want to leave everybody with. Uh, Yes, uh, that's going to be the future. We're going to dump a a load of crude oil into a hopper. And three or four days later, we're going to have gasoline going out one line and kerosene going out another line and motor oil going out in a different direction, jet fuel going out in a different direction and and plastics and uh, synthetic rubber. All of it uh, being done with uh, zero to minimum human intervention. And so either the the operators are going to have to learn to operate their pumps, this business of bumper cars at the circus operating pumps, that's going to have to come to a halt. And uh, and engineers are going to have to uh, understand why these pumps are fake. Why are we going through so many mechanical seals? What, why does the mechanical seal on the radiator water pump of my car run for 25 years without leaking? And I can't get seven months out of the cooling tower pumps at my chemical process plant. What's going wrong with these pumps? So uh, and there and there are just too many pumps that cause too much problems. So I think the future is going to be uh, automation. Uh, and uh, everybody must continue their education. You cannot stop learning. I want to leave, and that's what I want to leave people with. I love it. I love it. And I, I think you're right on. Uh, we've talked about bridging those worlds of mechanical and electrical. And I think this is just an extension of that. We've got to understand the system and, and it's changing just like everything else. We've got to adapt it and learn. So I love that, Larry. Thank you for sharing so much of your insight with us today. If, if anybody, if anybody is into a uh, uh, control automation, uh, uh, contact me. I don't know about control and automation. What I know about is the pumps and I know what has to be done. So I'd love to work with some company that, uh, that is into, uh, uh automating, uh, a chemical or a process. Uh, 
and uh, love to work with some company. I, that to me is the future. Yeah. And there, there's Larry learning as well. So, yeah, you know, that's too. a circle of everything. For me too. That's right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Charlie, thanks for bringing Larry on the show. He is always so fun to listen to, and I'm really excited for our listeners to get to hear his interview. Yeah, I love Larry. I never, he can, never has enough time uh, to share all of his knowledge. So we'll just keep interviewing him. Um, well, this brings us to the end of our show. Thanks everybody for listening and watching us on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, rate and review the podcast, iTunes, YouTube, wherever you listen to it. Let us know what you think. And always mention us at Empowering Pumps or using the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast. Uh, email me, podcast at empoweringpumps.com. And we'll be back every Monday with a new episode. So until then, be empowering. Yay. So I think we should just go ahead and jump into our Let's Get Social segment. My sound effect did not work today. That's fine. <laughs> so I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> I think there's a plug-in that I missed this week or something. Um, and it was so okay. cool last week. I know. I'm just so because cool. we talked about how cool we were. That's why this yeah. is happening. Okay. okay. So, so let's get social. Yeah.